uh, I got the uh, I got the speaker and the um, the panelists in the session uh, in order to focus our thoughts about this very murky subject. Uh, to each answer a specific question with a one sentence answer. Okay. Now both the both the choice of question and the precise wording of the question is the result of very careful back and forth negotiation. So this has been negotiated with every panelist and speaker. So the question is, will the superposition principle be seen to fail, not to fail, but be seen to fail within the next 25 years? And so as I pose this question to Professor Tohoft, uh, perhaps to save time, the panelists who could be invited to uh, uh, get up on the platform. Thank you. No. There's no quantum mechanics in itself is an exact theory, and there's no reason for whatsoever to think that the that the superposition principle will fail. So I my my answer is no. Good. Thank you. Now uh, here is the agreed upon uh, batting order uh, for the uh, panelist. So Zurek would go first. <laughs> I think I should go to conclusions then. The problem is I don't have the image on my computer. Okay, so it's great to be here on the multiple of species occasion. David, Frank. Um, when I got interested in this subject some 25 years ago, I always prefaced my talks by saying that foundations of quantum mechanics are a bit uh, like politics. Everyone thinks they know what's the right thing, but people who do it professionally end up with bad reputations. <laughs> I think now one of the things that have happened in the last 25 years is that perhaps this saying is not as true as it was before. Uh, for starters, I believe quantum theory is okay. I'm not going to give you a detailed summary of last 25 years, but I think that the two stories which were of great interest are one, experiment showed that it's okay to an extremely uh, great degree. So that gives me confidence that it's going to be okay for next 25 years. Tony, I've said, just saved a minute. And the other story that, that, that I think came through is that quantum states are extremely fragile. And so the story of decoherence, and I just give you this transparency as a reminder. You know it. I'm not going to go through it. I'll just uh, point to the operation here, uh, which gives you a reduced density matrix through the trace, et cetera, system immersed in the environment. Uh, various symptoms of quantumness are suppressed. Now, I think this story is going to continue to be explored. And I would like to, at the risk of being wrong, tell you two ideas which I think point directions in which it's going to be explored. One of them, I think in some sense there is a missing link here. This equation presumes Born's rule. One would like to understand Born's rule, the origin of probabilities, in a more fundamental way. Let me give you an idea of how this may happen. One way of getting probabilities is by appealing to ensembles, relative frequencies, etc. But there is another way which goes back to Laplace. 
That's a connection between ignorance and symmetries. What do I mean? Suppose you have two cards. You know one of them is a king. And you are sitting there, and you already have two kings in your hand. And you have a free choice of one of these two cards. If you do not know what's on the other side, you will not object to these cards being reshuffled. In this situation, Laplace says, these probabilities are equal, and they are one half. This story works if you are sitting at a table, but it gives you subjective probabilities. They are not good enough to do physics. However, I claim in quantum mechanics, you can use Laplace's ideas as an inspiration to do better. So the problem, objectively, one of the cards was a king. The ignorance was purely in our mind. In quantum mechanics, one can look at symmetries, and the symmetries that are involved are symmetries of entangled quantum states. I call the symmetry that's involved here environment-assisted invariance, or invariance for short. Let's look at a typical entangled Bell state and explore the consequences of its form. I can perform on it the same sort of operation I had with cards. Flip 0 and 1. Now, this produces a different state. The point is I can restore the original state without touching the system anymore. I can act on the environment. So if I do that, at the end, without touching the system anymore, I have undone the effect of the swap on the two cards. This means, because I've acted on the environment, which could have been beyond Saturn, that the probabilities, local probabilities of 0 and 1 must have been equal. Now, there is more to the story, but this is the basic link in it. And if you do a little bit more of algebra, Born's rule follows. Let me now take you to another story, and I'm told I have only six minutes left at this point. <laughs> and that, that goes, so in some sense, the previous idea was to deepen roots of decoherence. This one is to explore the consequences of environment more fully. First of all, we know the old story of measurement, apparatus, system from Neumann, etc. Observer was in a quandary because actually system and the apparatus were only entangled. It wasn't clear what came out or what could come out of this experiment. Decoherence helped because the presence of the environment selects a preferred set of states. They are the stable states. However, it doesn't really make things objective, because you can imagine another observer who would come in and measure something else on the system. This would re-prepare the state of what is supposed to be classical and defy uh, uh, whatever the first observer was trying to find out. However, I think in this progression of models, we were missing a key message. This is not how the environment is being used. The environment is being used in a much more profound fashion. Now, when Tony is looking at me and showing something to me, I do not interact with Tony directly. <laughs> <laughs> this was an <laughs> This was an I'm only interacting, I'm only intercepting a tiny fraction of the environment, which is implicated in decohering, Tony, sorry. <laughs> but because I have that tiny fraction of the environment, I can get all the information that's relevant. So this means that there is something which selectively multiplies some kinds of information and spreads them, advertises them through the environment. We never have to interact with the systems in question directly we intercept tiny fraction of the environment. So in other words, before Tony starts interacting with me directly, <laughs> environment in this picture is a witness and a channel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, wait, uh, what is your answer to the yes, no question? 
Uh, what was the question? The question to which to all answer no. I, I agree with him. No. For other reasons, but I do agree with him completely. Okay, our next speaker is Professor Harlow. First, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me as the token conservative on this panel. <laughs> because um, all I want to do is apply quantum mechanics to the universe. Uh, it's an inescapable <laughs> inference of the physics of the last 80 years, I believe, that we live in a quantum mechanical universe, a world in which the basic laws of physics conform to that framework of prediction that we call quantum mechanics. We perhaps have little evidence of peculiarly quantum mechanical phenomena on large or even familiar scales, but there's no evidence that the phenomena that we do see can't be explained in quantum mechanical terms and described by quantum mechanical laws. If this inference is correct, right, then the universe itself must be a quantum mechanical system and it has a quantum mechanical state. A theory of this state is a necessary part of any final uh, theory because without it there are no predictions of any kind. But textbook quantum mechanics must be generalized to apply to quantum cosmology because it relies on notions of measurements, observers, and it assumes in one way or another the quasi-classical realm in everyday, of everyday experience. But in a theory which seeks to explain the whole thing, there can be no fundamental division into observer and observed. Uh, in a theory which seeks to describe uh, the very early universe, observers and measurements cannot be fundamental because plausibly neither existed and there's no reason in a general quantum mechanical theory for there to be variables which behave classically uh, in all situations. So for this reason, we need a little generalization. Fortunately, thanks to the um, work of um, uh, Zurek and um, Everett and uh, Yosen Zay and uh, Gelman and others, right, we have such a generalization. Uh, the idea of the generalization is simply to, which is called, at least I call it, decoherent history's quantum theory, or it's sometimes called consistent quantum theory, is to replace the notion of measurement, right, by the notion of decoherence of histories. Decoherence of histories is a more precise, more observer independent, and more general, um, uh, and more general idea. The idea is quite simple and can be illustrated with the two-slit experiment. Uh, here's the two-slit experiment. You have a source of electrons. The electrons may go through the upper slit or the low slit, lower slit. That's two different histories on their way to arrive at the point Y on the screen. Uh, in the usual story, you can't assign probabilities to these alternatives because uh, they interfere. That is, the probability to arrive at Y on the screen will not be the sum of the probabilities to go through the upper slit and arrive at Y plus the lower slit to arrive at, at, at y, because in quantum mechanics, probabilities are squares of amplitudes, and the square of a sum is not equal to the sum of the squares. If you do um, assign, um, if you do measure which slit the electron went through, then in the usual story, the interference is destroyed, the sum rule is obeyed, and everything is fine. So usual quantum mechanics assigns probabilities to sets of histories which have been measured. But there's no particular reason why that measuring apparatus couldn't be uh, replaced by the interaction of the system with some external environment, say the cosmic microwave background radiation. In that case, the sum rule will still be obeyed. So the idea of decoherent history's quantum mechanics is that probabilities can be assigned to any set of alternative histories of the closed system constituting the universe, for which the interference va vanishes in fact, as a constant, it's called decoherence, as a consequence of um, the initial condition of the closed system, the wave function of the universe, if you like, uh, and uh, it's Hamiltonian. That's it. That's not a very deep theory, it's quite a simple one. However, it has a consequence. Uh, the consequence is there are many different decoherent sets, and therefore quantum reality, if you like, consists of many mutually exclusive and complementary views of uh, the universe, each which are all necessary for a complete description of the theory and of which we use only one. That, I believe, is the sticking point which will be addressed by the subsequent um, 
speakers. But the generalization allows us to, um, uh, describing things just in terms of interference, uh, allows us to discuss situations which are not normally connected with measurement situations. For example, we can assign probabilities in this theory to the moon when no one is looking at it and to density fluctuations in the early universe uh, when there was nobody around to uh, measure them. The usual Copenhagen story about measurements is not in conflict with this. It's a special case. Um, the quasi-classical realm of everyday experience is, as I mentioned, one of the decoherent sets that emerges from the particular initial condition of the universe which we have, but it's not the only one, and therefore we have this problem of many complementary views. Also, uh, in a simple discoverable quantum theory of the initial state, uh, such as Hawking's no boundary proposal, is very unlikely to predict a single quasi-classical realm with all the present complexity. It's after all a simple formula, and it would have to incorporate in some way, we'd have to believe that all the information of the complexity that we see uh, about us is compressible into that one single simple formula. That's not impossible, but it's very unlikely. Much more natural is the idea that, um, that the theory doesn't predict a single, quasi -class uh, single history of the quasi-classical realm, but is, predicts a whole family of them in which we happen to be in one. In other words, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I have to tell you that uh, in Hawking's wave function of the universe, it's very likely uh, that we're all Schrodinger cats in Hawking's wave function of the universe. Decoherent history's quantum mechanics is logically consistent, consistent with experiment as far as is known, uh, but general enough to apply to cosmology. It might be, not be the only theory of these properties, but I think it's the best alternative that we have at present. Thank you very much. Thank you. So what is your the answer to your question? To this question? Well, Tony didn't give all the alternatives. My, my answer to his question, which I already gave him, was how would I know? <laughs> Our next speaker is Professor Leggett. That I had uh, one view graph only, and had I uh, right, actually you're the only one who oh, obeyed really David Gross's rules. Oh, sorry, it really looks terrible, but uh, I apologize for that. I was also told that I could have only one group view graph. <laughs> and had I, <laughs> had I actually seen Jim's view graphs before I started going to view board one of his? <laughs> well, the original rule of the conference was no PowerPoint and one view graph. Okay. Six minutes from now, right? <laughs> okay. Six from now. <laughs> um, okay, 30 second reminder. Um, Jim already showed you a much better version of this view graph without all the sponges on it. I'm sorry for that. Um, sorry? No, no, I don't think. Uh, no, 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 I don't think it's going to work. Um, yeah. we, start, we, start from, we start with an ensemble of systems which start from some initial state S. They can go by paths, path A or path B to a final state E. And uh, just as in uh, Jim's view graph, we allow ourselves the option of injecting a certain amount of decoherence. And I'm going to assume for present purposes that um, I've taken a sort of experimental view of this, that I know experimentally what sorts of things induce decoherence, and I can turn them on or turn them off, as I, as I please in this case. And uh, then we ask, what, are, what are, is the probability of the system arriving at E? And of course, as you know, and as, as uh, um, Jim already said, it, the experimental fact is that if I put on enough decoherence, um, between the states A and B, then the probability of arriving through, when both the channels are open is just the sum of the uh, probability of arriving through each channel separately, and that's the, the straightforward common sense result. On the other hand, if I don't have any decoherence, then in general, the probability of arrival at E when both the channels are open is not simply the sum of the probabilities of arriving through each channel separately. I imagine I can me measure P A and P B by shutting off uh, the appropriate alternatives. Um, now, of course, as you all know, quantum mechanics has a very natural explanation, a very neat explanation of this. The total probability is the square of the amplitudes, and when you square them up, you get um, this, indeed the sum of PA and PB, but also you get this infamous interference term, um, which depends both on uh, the amplitude to go through, through path A and the amplitude to go through path B. And that's the term, of course, which will average to zero under the effect of decoherence. Now, what I think is very important to realize is that insofar as you attribute, and you may not want to, but if insofar as you attribute any kind of physical reality to the amplitudes psi and psi b, 
then it must follow that for each individual system of the ensemble, in order to get the interference property, both psi A and psi B must be non-zero simultaneously. And therefore, I, uh, if I would do ask this question of you, but there isn't time, I ask, um, uh, I regularly ask this when I give this kind of talk, I ask the audience to start off with, in this kind of situation, let's say a younger student experiment with electrons, is it the case, is it a true statement, that each individual electron goes either through slit A or slit B? And the overwhelming response is always no. There are usually one or two people who stick up their hands and say yes, but almost all the audience says no. So far, so good. Now, when we come, uh, uh, when we try to extrapolate quantum mechanics up to the uh, level of the counters and cats and so forth, the structure of the theory, uh, the amplitudes and so forth, in no way changes. What does change, of course, is that whereas at the microscopic level we, there are ways of avoiding decoherence, at the macroscopic level, decoherence is ubiquitous. And I, let me emphasize, I do not doubt that. That's a, I believe that's a true statement, and except in very, very special conditions, which we may discuss, um, decoherence is a more or less universal phenomenon at the macroscopic level. And therefore, if we're talking about, say, the, the uh, states of the universe containing a living or a dead cat, we all agree, and I agree, that in practice it's impossible um, to see the effect of interference between those two states. Um, now, does that mean, the crucial question now is, does that mean that uh, we can now say that one state or the other is definitely realized for each member of the ensemble? Because many, uh, many advocates of the decoherence argument either state explicitly or imply that the answer to that question is yes. And I say no. I say very definitely no. What, what I think this argument confuses is um, the, um, meaning, uh, that is, the, the meaning or lack of meaning of the quantum mechanical formalism with the evidence that that meaning or lack of meaning is correct. At the microscopic level, we could not, we agreed that we could not interpret the quantum formalism as simply saying each member of the ensemble goes through one alternative or the other. Okay. The reason we could not do, the, the evidence that we could not do that uh, is inference. By the macroscopic level, we've lost the evidence. Does that mean that we can suddenly change the meaning of the formula? That's like asking if during a murder trial, the vital piece of evidence, which would certainly have convicted the accused, suddenly disappears, has he suddenly become innocent? I say no. Okay. So, okay, um, is, that, uh, is that two minutes? Uh, okay, right, fine, good. Um, okay, so, so now, um, uh, so I, I would make this very firm statement myself, um, that decoherence does not solve the quantum measurement problem. So what are we left with? I think what we have to decide, first of all, is whether a quantum, the quantum mechanical amplitudes do or do not correspond to anything in the real world. Um, the, if, it, uh, if the answer is um, uh, yes, um, uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, if, um, if, um, if the answer is no, they don't, then what we have is basically the statistical interpretation, which is in some sense uh, a logical extension of the Copenhagen interpretation. And this basically says the whole formula of quantum mechanics is nothing but a recipe to, to give you the right probabilities at the macroscopic level. Well, fine, that's, that interpretation, I believe, is internally consistent. But if you, take, if you adopt it, you've got to take it deadly seriously. It means that the, all the huge formulas of quantum mechanics are describing nothing at all in the real world. And this is sometimes put up by, by calling quantum mechanics a theory of information or whatever. I don't think it helps. If someone comes back from the year 3000 and tells me that um, quantum mechanics is still going to be believed to be universally correct, that's the only interpretation I can fall back on. I shall immediately stop doing physics. Um, okay, the alternative is, to, um, is to, to seriously consider the hypothesis that maybe quantum mechanics is not the whole truth about the world, but at some stage something else is going to come in and quantum mechanics is going to break down. It has to break down, as it were, in the direction. It may or may not break down at a subatomic level, but it's got to break down at the level between the atom and human consciousness. Now, the most cr crude and obvious way in which it could break down, perhaps, is when the superpositions involved begin to involve the behavior of very large numbers, I think Frank said in much, 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 much greater than one, um, of, of uh, elementary particles. Um, and that was the alternative which uh, was first proposed to be tested and has been tested very uh, spectacularly in the last five years or so by experiments in particular on Joseph's injunction. And what we know is that the mere number of particles involved in the superposition does not seem to do anything to quantum mechanics. That's been demonstrated directly up to about 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 6 particles, uh, circumstantially up to about 10 to the 9 or 10 to the 10. So we're in pretty good shape there. But there are many other um, uh, more subtle features than just this, this gross number which are relevant. And I, uh, one, one uh, possibility, which I think Roger Penrose will, will talk about, is the possibility that when gravitational effects reach a certain level, you get a breakdown. But I think there are many others. 
And I personally believe that um, one of the most exciting areas over the next 25 years is going to be uh, attempts to test uh, quantum mechanics towards the level of everyday life under more and more sophisticated conditions involving, for example, more and more entangled correlations and so forth, and just check that it does or does not continue to work. Um, okay, good. <laughs> Okay, so my answer to that question is I don't know. I would give it um, a, a probability somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of breaking down, I believe. <laughs> and, and I certainly hope it does. <laughs> Our next speaker is uh, Professor Penrose. Thank you. Well, I also have one transparency. It was about this big, and I cut it into <laughs> smaller pieces. <laughs> yes, the, the idea that uh, Tony just referred to was that perhaps something... That's not so good either. This, oh, I see. It's that. Yes, yes, I'm standing there. Yes, I see. <laughs> yes. Um, there we are. The quantum state reduction is a real gravitational effect. This is the suggestion. In fact, all, uh, the, up, except for gravity, I would expect quantum mechanics to hold, but something different happens at, for the level of gravity. Now, one reason for saying that, there are lots of reasons, but one of the main reasons is that if we think about quantum gravity, is there any evidence what quantum gravity is like? Well, one of the main reasons that people study quantum gravity, or it used to be at least, was in order to answer the question about the singularities. What are the singularities? Do we need something to replace them? Now, there's a remarkable thing about the singularities, and that is that, well, we have basically, we know of two kinds, the Big Bang and the singularities which arise in gravitational collapse. And there's an enormous difference between the structure. And the uh, second law of thermodynamics springs from the fact that the Big Bang was something very, very small. You need a very low entropy to begin with, and it's been going up ever since. And in fact, one can estimate that within the observable universe, there is a precision of something like one part in 10 to the 10 to the 123, uh, characterizing the Big Bang as something very uniform. In fact, you can say perhaps the conformal curvature uh, was zero, the gravitational degrees of freedom was zero in the initial state, and that sets off the <laughs> second law. So that this is something very peculiar, that we have this gross time asymmetry, the, the one apparently observed facts of quantum gravity is that it should be time asymmetrical. Now, uh, I don't want to talk about black hole evaporation because that's a contentious issue. I think it does support the point of view I want to express here, but let's not go into that. Um, what I mainly want to talk about is that there's a clash of principles between general relativity and quantum mechanics. And particularly, I want to refer to the principle of general covariance and the principle of equivalence. Well, since I've only got, I don't know how many minutes left, uh, I'll only talk about the principle of equivalence, and this is basically illustrated by this picture here. So you know, we know that uh, all things fall at the same speed in the gravitational field. Or the question is whether quantum mechanics respects that as well as classical mechanics. Well, the principle of equivalence, there in fact are experiments that were done some while back. You see, you, you can think of doing quantum mechanics in the gravitational field in two different ways. You can either use the frame sitting on the table and put a term in the Hamiltonian, which treats the gravitational force as just another term. Uh, or you can go to a freely falling frame, do your quantum mechanics in that frame, and then transfer back to the other one. Well, in fact, the experiments and theory has been done for single systems, and uh, what you find is that you can go from one to the other if you just have this phase factor which transforms between the wave function done one way or the other way. Now, I want to point out that this phase factor, I mean, okay, it is just a phase factor, and so you might say it doesn't matter, but there is a T cubed in this factor here, which means that in a sense, um, you're looking at different vacua. Now, the, I want to look at the case where the speed of light has gone to infinity, so uh, if you wanted to do a full theory with general relativity, or even special relativity, you'd uh, think about accelerating frames and so on. And there's the famous uh, Unruh effect, which is a way of getting the Hawking temperature by, if you, if you fall freely into a black hole, you don't feel the temperature, but if you are held there, 
uh, then you, you do feel the temperature. And this re reflects the difference in two different vacua. Uh, one is the thermal vacuum, that's the one where you're he held, and the, uh, and the one where you fall freely is, is a, a non-thermal vacuum. Now, if you take the limit where speed of light goes to infinity, you find that uh, the temperature, the unroot temperature goes to zero. But nevertheless, you have this residual, which is this phase factor. So what I'm trying to argue is that there is, in fact, a, a difference between the two states, which you don't normally worry about because you've only got one gravitational field. But suppose you consider a superposition of two fields, thank you, and uh, the sort of picture I have is what was the bottom of an earlier transparency, except I never can get these around the right way. Uh, you could imagine an experiment where you put a lump of material into a superposition of two different locations. Here I have a photon source, beam splitter, and if it goes this way, it moves the lump from here to here. If it goes the other way, it leaves it in that original location. And I'm going to suppose that I, either one of these lump locations individually would be stationary. The question is whether the superposition is stationary or does it decay into one or the other. And I claim that if you consider the gravitational field of the lump, that you would expect to see a, an instability. That is, it would decay into one or the other in a time scale which can be computed purely from gravitational considerations. This, uh, there's a e thing I call EG here, which is the energy that it would cost you to move one instance of the lump away from the other one in the gravitational field of the other. Or more correctly, it's the gravitational, it, gravitational self-energy of the difference between these two mass distributions. And uh, I regard that as a fundamental uncertainty in the energy of the combined system, and that by the Heisenberg time, uncert time energy uncertainty relationship, one might anticipate that this thing can last only for a time which, you, which is h cross over that energy. OK, so that's the idea. Uh, and this is one of the ways that one can obtain that by looking at the fact that you are trying here to superpose two different vacua and you try to see what kind of trouble that's going to land you into. And the argument is that you, you have an integral here, which is the difference. It's, it's basically this cube term which is causing you the trouble. And so you try to see how much trouble it causes you. And the claim is that this would only last for, on the average, a time which is this integral, which is the same as the EG, which I just described to you. Now, if you want to try and test to see if this is true in, actual, in the actual world, one thing you have to worry about is that uh, when you work out this energy, you have to consider the um, things that this is. It's not a uniform body. You'd have various nuclei and so on, and you'd have the quarks that compose the neutrons and protons and so on. And so that if you try to displace one with respect to the other, because these are delta functions, you're going to get an infinite answer. And that's no good, because that means there's no quantum mechanics. But that isn't doing what I say you should do which is you consider that each one is in a stationary state to begin with, and then there's a bit of a spread. And then when you move them, you will get a finite answer. So it's really, uh, well, I see my time is up. So the question is now to do the experiment. Well, I have colleagues here who are, and you know, this slide you see is a very professional, professionally prepared one you see, so that it's done by professional people. And here's the, uh, here's the, the little object, which is, you have to think of this as something of the order of a thickness of a human hair, and it's to be put into a linear superposition of two different locations at the same time. And this is, I should say, work in progress. But the question is, uh, will you be able to detect that this will only survive for a length of time, which would be of the order of seconds in this type of experiment? So this is something for the future. And the hope is that something like this will be done within 25 years. And if so, the answer to your uh, question would be, um, yes, I think. Wasn't it that way around? Yes, yes we you, would. Your answer is yes. I would You're the only one who see, emailed me, yes. I would expect to see deviations from standard quantum mechanics right. at that level. So you and Leggett, are, you are yes, and Leggett is uh, modified yes. The, well, I would only give probabilities to uh, mm. so, but right. there are more, more favorable ones than he does. Right, thank you very much. On this session in this conference is unique in that uh, everyone in this room can claim to be an expert on the subject. So I'm going to actually allow uh, a few um, violent objections, um, but extremely brief, please. So whoever wants to, please. 
please, please stand up and speak loudly. I have a question for Professor Toft. I'd like to know how in this viewpoint electrons, in different electrons are identical, both in either or both in the sense of Fermi statistics, which is the principle that keeps matter stable, or in the sense that when you put electrons in penning traps, individual electrons have the same g factor to 10 decimal places. If you can explain either of those in this framework, I would be very pleased. Well, um, I'm not viewing electrons as particles at all, but rather uh, in a, as, for instance, a cellular automaton-like model. If the, if the laws of nature here are identical to the laws of nature here, electrons here should be identical to electrons here. So, um, in, I, I don't think the, the problem of this sort would arise. The way you phrase it, I don't think any problem would arise in this picture. Electrons are identical particles. Well, you, you can't really isolate them. They are related to muons, to all the other particles, and uh, our distinction between what an electron is and what a muon is and what a proton or other particles is is going to be less clear if you, the closer you come to the Planck scale. Like, so from this point of view, the theory I have differs very, very little from the standard picture. It's at the Planck scale that the deviations become really sizable. Uh, any other objections to what you've heard in the last 45 minutes? I'm sure people have viewed. Please. Well, I would just like please. To say oh, you don't need. I don't need. need. No, yes, like please stand up. That please stand up. Oh. Say that there is a consistent thermodynamic, uh, consistent philosophical interpretation, namely that these are just rules. And it seems to me that uh, a little modesty is called for here. I'm very allergic to the wave function of the universe because I don't think this is defined in any sort of operational way. And I come back down again that a real physicist is someone who's working conceptually with real experiments. And I think that quantum mechanics is a wonderful description of the universe. And in that sense, it surely contains some level of deep truth. But truth itself has to be thought, taken in a philosophical view. And I think there's a real danger in a conference of theorists of pushing our pictures beyond rational belief. Now, we've learned that it's important to push them as far as we go, and that's why I like to listen to Tony Leggett and why I was relieved to say, well, at least I'm consistent with the interpretation of Copenhagen. That these are wonderful calculational rules. We should see where they break down or if they break down. I believe that all our theories will eventually break down, but the question is, how do we find out? And what I think is rather clear is that experiment has to play an important role. Okay, one of our panelists, Professor Harlow. Thank you. I just want to point out that the uh, extension contains within it all that you want for the interpretation of experiment. So there's no conflict. And I believe that many people here have suggested that quantum mechanics will break down. We will only find out if we push it to the limits, which in this case is cosmology. Okay, uh, perhaps one more violent objection or statement, comments. Uh, Charlie, do you want to say anything? No. Okay. Nobody else? Okay. Even the people that are usually very noisy are quiet.